We are happy to welcome on the first ever guest of the podcast, Dr. Matt Harmon. He is a play-by-play broadcaster for the New York Red Bulls, for the Monmouth University Hawks, for the Shore Sports Network. He also teaches at Monmouth University, does a lot of stuff, and he is the first guest. So, Harmon, do you feel any pressure being the first guest to leave a, a good first impression for the next guest? Well, I would say this, Ryan. I mean, clearly I made some kind of impression on you and Matt during your time here in Monmouth. If I'm the first guest, if I'm the guy who's going to be the first person, I've already I've already left a good impression. But I'm 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 psyched to be on with you guys. I'm really excited for this uh project that you guys have taken on and, and have up and going. Um and, and I'm excited to be a part of it and, and help you guys get it off the ground and uh hopefully see it through. All right. Well, we've been talking you up for a couple of months, so I'm, I'm excited for this. Uh, I can't wait to see how it goes, but I did want to start off because just recently you became Dr. Matt Harmon. So, so take us through that a little bit, especially in, in this year where a lot of different stuff is happening. What was it like to f- complete that process and become a doctor? Uh, it was pretty awesome. I, I won't lie. I mean, listen, this was something that uh, I started, believe it or not, 11 years ago uh, in 2009. <laughs> so if there's something to be said for uh, persistence and perseverance, this is probably a good testament to it. Um, I've been chipping away at it little by little. I had to take a, a break here or there just because of other things that I do, teaching included, broadcasting included, some other things as well, trying to maintain um, a good family life. So it's been you know, do it when you can do it. But uh, fortunately enough, this past week, I defended my dissertation and um, was able to finish the, the process off and now have those, you know, two two letters in front of my name, I guess. Well, that was a that was a big news break on I guess it was Wednesday when we saw that on Twitter, you changed your uh, name and your bio to Dr. Matt Harmon. Uh, so we, we got excited. I texted Ryan saying, Hey, we need to introduce him as doctor. Now it's going to look really good when we put it on Spotify. Um, but I think this kind of shows us a good example because a lot of people I think see school as you got to go straight through kind of right from when you want to go to the PhD route to just do it consecutively, but to kind of chip away at it, like you said, kind of shows how there's that other way that a lot of people, you know, feel pressured to do it all immediately within a short span. Yeah. So listen, Matt, I mean, to, to your point, a couple of things there. I mean, I, I graduated with my bachelor's degree in 1996 and I chipped away at my master's, which I got in 2004. Um, and, and the doctoral degree that I have is an EDD. So that was one that I also chipped away at. Again, it took me, it took me 11 years. And when I first started it, I actually knew that it was going to take some time I wasn't, I wasn't hoping it was going to take 11. Um, But I said, you know, even to myself, I said, if I can get this done in the span of a decade, I'll be pretty happy. Hopefully it can enhance what I do here at Monmouth a little bit um, and, and open some other doors, not just for me, but for the sports program that we have here on campus, give it a little credibility. I thought that was important. And that was always a big part of, of why I wanted to get involved with it. So now, now I, you know, I've, I I joked the other night when I was talking at home to my wife, I said, now I don't have to take another class ever again. If I don't want to, I got my bachelor's, I got my master's, I got a a doctoral degree and EDD in education. Um, So I I, I feel like in a lot of ways that what, what we offer here in Monmouth, which you guys are obviously super familiar with now it it gets a little, hopefully shot in the arm and a little punch to, to push it to the next level. I'm glad you kind of brought up all the, the different things that you do, because that was one of the things I wanted to ask you. You brought up the broadcasting, the teaching, uh, going to through the process of becoming a doctor. So I wanted to ask you about your, your work-life balance. I mean, from the outside, it looks like you're, you, you take care of everything pretty well, but has it been tough throughout your life to kind of find a good balance between all the things that you do and then also finding time for your family and just relaxation? Uh, I mean, listen, Ryan, I, I would be the one who would tell you, and I, and I, and I've told students along the way, like, if you have a family situation, if you got something going on at home, that should always be first and foremost, that's paramount to anything else, everything else will fall. Um, and, and, and listen, because 
it actually might sound crazy because I have multiple jobs. Yes, I am extremely busy and I'm, and I'm usually running from one place to the other, but in doing that, it actually has opened up um, large chunks of time windows that a lot of people don't have. So just as an example, let's say you work a normal eight to five, nine to five, 10 to six type job. Um, when you have kids and I have three boys, I'm fortunate enough to have three, three amazing kids um, that, you know, based on where they are education wise, what grade they're in, what they have going on. Um, I, I can usually make most of their stuff in the afternoon. You know, I mean, playing high school sports. My one son was a college athlete for a little while. You know, I have a younger one who's in fifth grade. He's making his way up the ranks. My middle guy's in high school. Like I, I, I try and not miss what they have going on. And I've been fortunate enough to be able to gear my teaching schedule one way, teach some classes at night, teach some early morning classes, um, I mean, you guys know the broadcast world. It's usually at night and on the weekend. And, I, you know, do I miss things? Yes, I miss things, but I don't miss much, you know. And in, in a lot of ways, I've been fortunate enough that on on certain days or a good chunk of days, if I want to, I can drop my kids off at school on their way. I can pick them up from school. I can see them after school. I can help with their homework. Um, and, and for whatever the reason, I've been able to juggle it all enough to keep uh, – keep everybody happy within the house and, and keep myself sane. So I want to kind of go back to something you mentioned about the sports program at Monmouth, uh, something that really kind of grew when Ryan and I were at Monmouth um, and continue to grow once we left as well. So kind of talk about the future of that program, which I, something that we can attest to really expanded in our last couple of years um, at the school. Yeah, I mean, listen, Matt, I, I can go all the way back to the very first class that I taught here at Monmouth, which was in 1999. I was a couple of years out of school and um, asked and proposed to come back and teach the first sports broadcasting class that was ever here. Now, why did I do that? I mean, number one, I loved the school. But number two, I always felt like when I was here, as great as the program was, it was it was missing something. Um, it, and it wasn't necessarily you know, we, we did a great job teaching radio. We did a great job teaching TV, broadcasting, putting it together with journalism. Um, but if you were a sports person, we didn't really have that. So actually the idea for this started more than 20 years ago. The first class I taught was a sports broadcasting special topics class. I taught it in the third floor of the plant of the student center before we moved over here to Plangier where the, when the radio station used to still be um, in the student center and probably not really having much of an idea of, of what it was like to be an educator, even though, you know, I, I was fortunate. My dad was a, was a teacher and coach for a really long time, 35 years before he passed away. Um, so that kind of got it off the ground. And then the more comfortable I felt with it, then I actually got another class. I picked up the, what used to be announcing class, which is now called performance and radio that you guys have, have both had in your time at Monmouth. Um, and then I started to find myself more involved along the way, teaching rather than just one class per semester, then it became two, then it became three. And again, during that time, chipping away at my master's when I could, uh, but still always in my mind having this, could we have a sports type cluster program on campus? Um, and, and listen, fortunately enough, we've, we've had the minor, the sports comm minor, which has done really well, but I I think we're ready to move that to the next level and kind of create something that is not sports specific. And I say that because I think that's important. You can't just know sports and that's it. You still have to have the skills in journalism, public relations, radio, TV, um, even our communication studies program that we have here, all those become really important. And then my idea has always been, can you tie business into it? Can you tie uh, sociology into it, psychology into it, even classes from the English department that might be able to help. So this this interdisciplinary idea um, has always been in the back of my mind. And, and, and to be quite honest, I'm hopeful now that we can move it to the next level. Would you say that that Monmouth maybe deserves more recognition than they get uh, for, I'd say specifically the sports broadcasting part of what they offer? Because I mean, it, it, if you go to I'd say some bigger colleges, you go there, you might not call a game for one or two years, but if you go to Monmouth, you can get into 
several of your classes very early on and then for the radio station you can start start calling sporting events i'd say almost immediately i know that's what i did i know that's what matt experienced so would you say that maybe mom deserves a little more recognition in that regard uh recognition i i would agree with that ryan and i think sometimes um and and listen during this 2020 pandemic thing i've been fortunate enough to do um semi normal it was weekly but now we've kind of scaled it back a little bit on purpose podcast series with president Leahy, and and he and i have openly talked about on our episodes mammoth being essentially always this hidden gem you know i mean listen we you've got the location and and clearly you got to have more than that but we we not only have this amazing spot a mile uh from from the atlantic ocean we've got the facilities, we've got the reputation, I think, that oftentimes definitely gets lost. You mentioned bigger schools. I mean, clearly there are amazing schools out there that do a great job with sports, broadcasting, journalism, those type majors for students that want to get involved with it. What you just said, though, is a a thousand percent correct, Ryan. Um, Being able to get involved for four years rather than two or one or you know, doing stuff that might not necessarily enhance your career moving forward for the first couple of years at big schools. That's always been to me, a selling point at Monmouth. You know, I, I, I still give tours. I still talk to students who are looking at school and I always say that to them. Paramount, you can pretty much come in and pitch an idea within reason, carve out your own niche and create what, what you envision yourself moving forward at a school like Monmouth. And not too many people are going to tell you no. Most people are going to encourage it. Most people are going to let you have that creative flexibility that maybe you're looking for that other schools might not offer. Um, can we get better? Can we improve? Of course. You know, can can our curriculum change a little bit and and probably be updated? Absolutely. Um, but I think we're in a really good place right now, despite you know the the weirdness of of 2020, which hopefully goes away sooner rather than later. Um, but yeah, I, I would agree with you. I think Monmouth probably we could be a little higher in the national profile. Um, I mean, even from a sports perspective specifically, look at where we are. Here's here's Monmouth. Then you've got New York City. You've got Philadelphia. Boston, not too far away. Washington, D.C., not too far away. Baltimore, not too far away. We're in this amazing hub of so much activity, sports-wise, media-wise, that I I think sometimes people do um, forget about it, thinking maybe the grass is greener elsewhere. But I'm looking outside right now on a rainy day. We've got plenty of green grass on campus. I know uh, one thing that's at least I underestimated initially, but I kind of realized how expansive the alumni network is, especially uh, in our field. Um, Do you think the location obviously kind of plays a factor in having so many people at the professional level, whether it be like Major League Baseball or the NFL? I know we have people at all kinds of radio and TV stations. Uh, So what's it like for that? And then also for you to see your former students maybe even bump into them sometimes when you're on the road or do other uh, things on your travels? It's actually, Matt, that's a great question. And it's really funny. I was just having a conversation in this past week um, with another faculty member here on, on campus, someone who was a teacher of mine. He'll probably hate that I say that, but, but Professor Morano, who kind of heads up our journalism department, um, has the outlook under his umbrella, which is our student newspaper. And he and I were talking about essentially the the – network that we've created for people that work in sports. I mean, we've got people all over the place. We've had people write for some of the biggest newspapers in New York City. As you mentioned, we've got people all over the country at different radio and TV stations. We've had people call Olympic events. Uh, We've got people working in some of the biggest sports companies and leagues, the NHL, ESPN, uh, that you could could want, you know? Um, So yeah, I mean, do Do I take pride in that? Absolutely. Because I, listen, I go back my first year at Monmouth as a student was 1993. I was playing football at that time. Then I had gotten injured, fell in love with what we did at the radio station and the outlook. So essentially from 1993 to now 2020, I've seen everybody come and go one way or the other, because short of maybe a, um, 
a real small window of time that I wasn't here. I graduated in 96, came back in 99 to teach my first class, but still knew so many people that were here in those couple of years. I've seen people enhance what they do at Monmouth and then take it into the workforce and have great success. We have um, an amazing networking opportunity with alums of people in sports, in media. Um, so it, it, it really is tremendous. So I'm extremely proud of that. And I, and I love when I do bump into people on the road, which does happen from time to time. Um, so, I mean, listen, I, again, to go back to the point when I was discussing with Ryan, I think we're in a really good place. I think the opportunities here are immense. Um, and I can only hope that they continue to grow. Well, Harmon, you've brought up 2020 a couple of times. So as a sports broadcaster yourself, I wanted to kind of steer it in this direction. You've broadcasted sports for a very long time, but I think 2020 was different for everybody in, in that field. So what was it like first off when sports just completely shut down, but then also when you did come back, how different was it broadcasting in a, in a COVID world? Uh, it's, it's been very challenging guys to be, to be fair. I mean, listen, you guys know for me, um, and mentioned in the beginning, I've worked for the Red Bulls. This is my sixth year doing radio for them, work for Monmouth, doing games, um, work for the shore sports network, still doing some high school stuff, some other things that, that come up from time to time. And essentially the third week of March, everything stopped, you know, just when I should be moving into, a really busy season of calling uh, all the Red Bull games, doing some lacrosse stuff, um, maybe, you know, a baseball opportunity or something like that here or there, but really Red Bull is, is my main broadcast thing right now over the course of a a whole year, the fall gets extremely busy with mama soccer, mama football, uh, shore sports network, high school football stuff. But I mean, if you would have told me that, two games into the major league soccer season, we played home at Cincinnati. We played um, away at Salt Lake. That was game number two. If you would have told me after I came home from Utah that we weren't going to have games anymore, I, 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 I'm not even sure that I would have believed in anybody, but yet here we were. And it wasn't just, there's no games. There was really no anything at all. There were no sports. There was no broadcasting. Um, and, and to be fair, it was a real challenge for me because you guys know, not only is teaching so important to me, but broadcasting is as well. So to not have that outlet uh, was was definitely difficult for sure. Um, so so what do you do in March, April, May, and even into June? I mean, we you know we we found ways to try and create content with Red Bull, doing a lot of like you and I are and and Matt are doing right now on Zoom, um, trying to stay in touch with people, trying to keep your audience connected to the team. So there's a lot that we that we tried to do, but there's no substitute for the actual games. There's no substitute for the games. Um, So then when you're not doing those games, it's it's really hard. Um, And then since the season has kind of come back around, it's been interesting. You know, the first three games for Major League Soccer, everybody played down in Orlando in the bubble in the MLS's back tournament. Um, And and it was made very clear there is no travel right now for broadcasting. So we did those games remote. We did them from Red Bull arena. Um, We actually made a really great production about it. We did an hour pregame show. We did post game. We use social media. Um, So I think it opened some ideas as to how we can do things, but even right now it's still, it's still a challenge. I mean, we've had, uh, changes in our high school football season on Shore Sports Network because teams have come down with COVID and had to quarantine. There's no mama sports this semester on campus. Um, still with Red Bull, I will say the one thing I've been extremely fortunate about is that once the season started, we've still broadcast every game. Home games we go to, away games I'll be doing. Um, we have an away game even across the river. We play at NYC on Sunday. I'll be doing the game just like I'm doing it right now with you guys. And that's remotely sitting at at home um, broadcasting through my computer. But at the end of the day, we're still broadcasting. And that's the most important thing. Uh, One thing you mentioned to me uh, back when I interned with the Red Bulls in 2018, I went up to the broadcast booth before a game and it must have been 
like 30 degrees. So I asked you why the windows were open and you said you always like to have the atmosphere kind of come in and get the feel for the game. So now when you open the windows to see virtually no one at Red Bull Arena, does that feel eerie at all? It, it must feel incredibly strange to kind of look out and not hear thousands of people um, and that rabid fan base, especially. Matt, a couple of things there. Number one, I'm in, I'm impressed that you remember I said windows open. Always windows open. Doesn't matter what the temperature is because I do like to hear the crowd noise and the atmosphere. Um, I feel like as a broadcaster, you can you can play off that a little bit and just soak it in and realize why you're there. So yes, it's been very um, different. I think is the is the best way to say it. To to look over an amazing facility that we have in Red Bull Arena and not have any fans out there, um, you know, you guys are, are astute enough to follow multiple professional leagues. So, you know, that there's been piped in crowd noise and we get that in our, we get that in our headset. Um, and we actually, when I say we, my partner, Steve Jolly, who's a former Metro star player, Red Bull player, he and I have been, you know, paired together for the last six years. We've actually had a lot of fun with it. So in the middle of the 30th minute when all of a sudden you hear the let's go Red Bull chant. One of us will usually say, well, yeah, the crowd's really into it tonight. So good to have everybody here. Everybody clearly knows that there is no crowd, um, but it's been, it's been different. It's been different. I mean, even, even to the point where at high school games that we do, because we usually try and pick a pretty good game every week, some rivalry type games uh, where the band would be loud and people would be all into it. There's just no noise at all. And those, and those games have some fans at them, but they're so limited with the numbers. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's different. It's really different. And I can't say that I enjoy it because I love the interaction with people. I love walking into Red Bull arena. Not that everybody knows who, who I am, but you know, people will, Hey, Hey, you know, how you doing, Matt? Talk about the team, talk about the game a little bit. Um, now we've been able to do it. We've probably had more social media interaction with people this year with our broadcasting on um, tune in and the Red Bulls app and on online than we've ever had before, because people I think know they, they won't really ever see us. So now's a good time to interact. And we've been able to use social media that way, which has been beneficial. How does the preparation process in this kind of environment change? Because I'm not familiar with the MLS protocols, but I know for baseball and football, for example, the reporters, the broadcasters, they're not going to the locker rooms anymore. They have to rely on, on Zoom meetings and just other ways of extracting information. So how's your, your preparation process changed? Uh, it, it's had to change for sure, Ryan, to your point. I mean, listen, for for Red Bull, for sure, and even stuff at Monmouth. I mean, I, I would walk over to practice once a week and just see what was going on. Um, I would drive to Red Bull the training facility and try and get there once a week just to watch training, just to, you know, one, one of the fun parts of my job, at least the way that we have it set up. And it's pretty much with everything that I do, Mammoth and Red Bull is I have such access. I can just talk to people. I don't, I don't need permission to just have a conversation. I, I can grab somebody coming off the training field, talk to them for a couple minutes. Uh, interaction with coaches is usually amazing. So even that one-on-one face-to-face that you're so used to is gone. Um, So that element you've had to now substitute a little bit to, to, I think maybe even rely a little bit heavier on information and data that you would get from game notes or websites, just to be able to fill that gap. Um, Travel is certainly a big one as well, not traveling with the team and going on road games of which I always do, and that's where you can get some of your best information sitting on a plane next to somebody for an hour to four hours, depending on where you're going and having conversations, whether it's coaches or players. And, and it's not always guys about like the X's and O's of the game. Sometimes it's just about who they are as a person, who that coach and, you know, how they came up and different things like that family connections, um, those little, I, I say, I'll say nuggets, those little nuggets that you can get that we probably don't have as much right now, but fortunate enough that we can still Zoom, FaceTime, do these type things. Um, you know, I would always get to, so if we had a seven o'clock game at Red Bull Arena, I'd walk in at five o'clock, usually try and get there about two hours before the game. 
usually spend the first half hour or so checking in, saying hello, um, just making the rounds in essence to be social. Usually an hour and a half before the game, we would do a live sit down in person coaches interview. Right now, those interviews get done as you and I are talking right now on Zoom, StreamYard, some other sites that we use. Um, so, I mean, to be able to see somebody right now and actually, you know, from where we are at Red Bull Arena, we're on the very top of the stadium on the sixth floor at you know, 530 when we're getting ready to go on. You can literally, if you wanted to, yell down to the field and say hello to people, which we have done, and give them a give them a hello and a wave. That's kind of the that's that's our face to face right now. Um, so you know, clearly not having some of those capabilities, I, I think just being able to rely on the information, but still have such a knowledge base of what's going on, you can still tap into that when you need to. So you mentioned calling road games remotely from your house or other places. How what, how much of a challenge is that as a broadcaster to kind of stay? Because I know I would really struggle with it because I'm someone who loves the crowd environment and being there. To, so to kind of watch off the screen and still be in tune and be able to kind of get the ebbs and flows of the game, uh, what, what challenges does that present to a broadcaster? Because I know that's what a lot of other sports do as well. Uh, so how have you been able to kind of stay with the ebbs and flows of a game being remote? Uh, it's been a challenge, Matt, for sure, because I have never been, and I think we've, we've probably talked about this in classes at some point along the way. I have never been a fan of, and I know, you know, financially in the direction that the, that the industry goes, you know, can you call a game remote? Can you do it? Yeah. But um and and not to say tv versus radio i think it's easier on tv than it is on radio and and i've always made the point and you guys have heard me say it so many times when i do a game on radio i need to see what's happening and right now i am at, for a for a red bull road game that i'm watching on my screen i'm just depending on whatever they're showing me on tv i can't see the conversation that might be taking place on the sideline i can't see um, an interaction between two players that if I did at in a normal situation or at a home game, I'd be talking about and I'd be describing. Um, so it's definitely, it's definitely different and it's definitely a challenge. I can't say that I like it, um, but it beats the alternative, which is not doing the games at all. Um, and then just, I mean, listen, I do the games when, when we have a road game right now, I'm in the, the second story of my house and I have an open office I have three kids, as I mentioned. So, I mean, you basically have to tell everyone, be as quiet as possible for the next two hours. And that's not always easy with three boys running around the house. Um, the one thing ha that has been easier, I will say this, if we play a longer interview in the pregame or at halftime, it's a lot quicker to just run to the bathroom than it would be at the stadium because I can just go across the hall if I want to run down and grab something to eat, that's a lot easier. Uh, so it has it has tiny little benefits, but not anything that would ever take the place of being at the stadium and being at the game. Well, Harmon, uh, I, I do want to talk a little bit about the the Red Bulls before we have to get off with you. Uh, Matt will have some, some more in-depth questions, but they are seventh right now in the Eastern Conference. They are going to be in the playoffs, but I just wanted to get your input on how the season has gone this year. Uh, it, it's been up and down. It's been a roller coaster for sure. Um, I felt like after preseason of which I, you know, I have the ability to go out and cover the team in preseason. The last couple of years we've been in Arizona, which we were this year as well. Um, I felt like the team was in a really, really good, a good place, you know, and I think would, would have flown under the radar a little bit for some of the bigger name teams in major league soccer. We had a win on opening day against Seattle, uh, against Cincinnati, I'm sorry. Then we went to Utah, um, had a 1-1 draw coming home. Then that's when everything kind of stopped. Um, we had a pretty big move. We had a new uh, head of sport hired, Kevin Thelwell, who came over from Wolves in the Premier League. And I think he did a really good job of just letting things be as they, as they were, see what he wanted to change, um, come coming back, going down to Orlando in the MLS's back tournament. We got off to a great start, beat Atlanta one nothing, and then lost the next two games, um, being shut out by Columbus and Cincinnati and not advancing into the knockout stage. 
about a week or so after that, I guess, um, or maybe two weeks after that, our head coach was replaced. So we've had an interim head coach for the last several weeks. Um, but I, I would say right now, the team is in a really good place. Uh, the last five games, we haven't lost. We've got two wins, three draws. As you mentioned, we've qualified for the playoffs for the 11th straight year in Major League Soccer, which, is, which isn't always easy. Um, you know, we've got two tough games remaining. We play New York City this weekend. We play Toronto at home the last game of the year. And I think in a year, Ryan, that has been so strange and in essence, home field advantage doesn't mean a whole lot this year. Uh, you've seen a lot of teams have actually better road records and maybe even home records this season in Major League Soccer. I think if we can if we can keep this run together, I think we're going to be a dangerous team come playoff time and a team that a lot of other clubs are not want to play. One thing I noticed about this year's roster, the two oldest players on the team are 30 years old. So it's one of the younger teams you'll see kind of in Major League Soccer. And I think that's what makes Red Bull so special, uh, as you and I have probably talked about before, developing through the academy and everything. But one player who's kind of taken the MLS world by storm is Caden Clark, a 17-year-old player who I've mentioned to Ryan a couple of times. Uh, I, I saw on social media the Red Bulls tweeted out or, or Andrew Vizano, maybe who's the social media guy um, for Red Bull, a 10 year old kid opening up his Jersey. He's only seven years younger than the guy. And he's out there scoring in back-to-back -back, uh, games for his MLS debut. So what's it been like and what makes him such a dynamic player to not only be 17, be in high school, then to get the call up to the first team start and then score in back-to-back -back games. You no, know, listen, and, and I got to give a lot of credit to our academy director, Sean McCafferty. He had a relationship with Caden um, going back years and years. Caden, a, a kid who, who was born in Minnesota, um, you know, and, then, and there was this whole territorial thing that went on with, with Major League Soccer. Red Bull actually had to buy his rights from Minnesota, even though he had never um, – done anything within their academy but now part of the red bull system he was a guy that even was talked about in preseason about a guy that you know maybe keep an eye on on this kid because that's what he is he's still a kid as you said he's just 17 years old but i think the one thing that has been a positive for caden is um he he seems to have a high level of maturity on and off the field i think he's taking everything in stride um, and I and I can't honestly say that I've had any face to face conversation with him because I haven't because of the situation. But talking with coaches and some of the older players about him, um, it, it's clear that he's made an impact and has shown that he belongs, um, not just at the major league soccer level, but within the professional ranks. And and the, to your point, Matt, like the video that got released, I thought it was awesome. That. 10 year old kid being so excited. Um, but that is soccer, right? I mean, in, in a way that's, that's the soccer world. It's not uncommon to have 18, 19, 20 year old players make huge impacts, not just here in the United States worldwide as well. It takes place. Um, you do have to have a, a certain level of maturity. It's not, it's not always for everyone. And there's probably just as many I'll say bad or negative stories in terms of the flip side of it as, as there are in terms of the positives right now with Caden, but he's been a lot of fun to watch. He's been, he's been uh, not just quality on the field, but you know, he had two big goals his first time out um, that helped us grab some points, which right now have become extremely important. So he's given a little shot in the arm uh, to the team from an emotional standpoint and, and a playing standpoint. So it's been really fun to see. I want to shift from the younger guys to some older guys. How strange is it to see Bradley Wright Phillips and Luis Robles in other uniforms this season? Uh, it, it's been strange for sure. Um, you know, like we, we don't play LA this year, LAFC. So we don't get to see um, Brad in person, which I think would be, would be, you know, different. Um, and unfortunately, you know, listen, Luis Robles was a guy who was very, very good to me. Um, in my time here, we had some amazing conversations. He was always media friendly without question. Um, great to my kids when they would be around training or the stadium, but I mean, that's part of the business. And I think he, he, he talked about it during the course of the year. 
um, he, he, he knew it was coming at the end of the 2019 season and almost prepared himself for it. Um, when Red Bull first played Miami, the game was down in Florida. So I didn't get to see him in person. And then actually in the return game, he had broken his arm. So he didn't, he didn't play in the second game, um, which I think would have been emotional, even with nobody in there because of what he meant to the team because is what he's meant to the organization and, and because of his standing in major league soccer. So, I mean, listen, hopefully that changes all next year and he does get to come back and play at Red Bull arena, whether he's with Miami or somebody else and, and the same for, for BWP. Yeah, I didn't think so. I, I had to transcribe all those interviews from Robles. Uh, whenever it was always the running joke, whoever got Robles was going to be there for an extra 30 minutes. Uh, Ryan, he had the most inspirational postgame speeches, no matter win or loss. Uh, I always left um, inspired, to say the least. So it's, it's nice to see him uh, still playing um, and playing well. I want to ask you about Major League Soccer as a whole. Uh, so when my first... I guess kind of memory of major league soccer kind of came early on in high school of sitting down and watching it on, I guess it was the newly formed NBC sports network at the time. Uh, there's 14 or 15 teams in the league. Now within the next four years, there's going to be 30. So what do you think's kind of contributed to this? I would, I would, I guess I would call it exponential growth of the league. I mean, they've been adding teams almost every single year over the past decade. So what do you think, Don Garber and the rest of uh, upper management has kind of done to expand the league so fast. Well, I mean, it, it's going to maybe sound strange to say it, and I'm sure some would, would always hesitate with this. It is the most popular sport in the world. You know, it might not be here in the United States, but even if you look at participation numbers, I mean, there's more kids playing soccer than there pro probably still are any other sport, even in the United States. Um, What's been the problem? I mean, go back to the days of the old North American Soccer League when the Cosmos were the team in the late 70s and the early 80s. That league grew too big, too fast, and probably didn't have the structure in it in place for the long haul. And, and then the long window of, I mean, there was no real first tier professional soccer league in the United States for almost a decade before Major League Soccer came back in 1996. And, and there's no question without you know going through the whole history of it the league struggled for a good chunk of their first almost decade big moves david beckham that's number one um opening that door for other international players to come to the united states why the expansion so big i think probably owners have seen an opportunity um and I'll say affordable, not affordable for anybody that's in this Zoom right now, but affordable if you've got that money. Clearly, it would be more expensive to buy an NBA team, a Major League Baseball team, an NFL team, uh, probably even an NHL team. But if you're if you're someone who believes in growth and you want to still get in, it's not at the ground floor anymore. It's somewhere between here and the penthouse. You know, you're you're probably in the middle of the building for Major League Soccer. But if you still want to get into a league that's only 25 years old, you can still do it. Um, and there are, you know, listen, the last couple of cities that just got added, Austin, Charlotte, places like that, um, I think are going to be great for Major League Soccer because they are soccer hotbeds, which because of the, the sports landscape and culture of this country, soccer does sometimes get forgotten about because football is so big because baseball is so big and not just football nfl football college football as well you know where some of these smaller places are so locked into what their uh ncaa teams are doing i i think i still think to this day the sky is the limit for major league soccer because um you know is it different than a lot of other leagues in the world yes the calendar is different there's no promotion relegation you know, some of those things might change over time, but still right now to this day, uh, it's a it's a viable soccer league. It's in a good place. It's still growing. Watch games from week to week. And, and you know, I, I think the only thing that is holding the league back are people that have maybe are, are more probably my age and maybe even a little bit older <clears throat> that for those 10 years didn't have anything to watch from the late eight from the mid eighties to the mid nineties after the NASL had folded and major league soccer didn't start yet. 
So you turned your attention to somewhere else. You watched the Premier League. You watched the Bundesliga. And those were the teams that essentially you grew up with. So then now why would you come back to Major League Soccer? The demographic, <clears throat> excuse me, the demographic, quite honestly, for MLS is guys like you. You know, guys that are in their 20s that um, can can latch on to something that it can be your own moving forward. Uh, you mentioned a guy in David Beckham who's now obviously an owner down in Miami. In terms of growth of the league, do you think he, and this has been something that's been talked about a lot, for his ability to kind of attract the bigger name players over, do you think he's going to be kind of instrumental in the league's future over the next five to ten years? I don't think it's going to hurt, Matt. I mean, I, you know, listen, that area of South Florida has always been a little strange when it comes to sports and who they support and how they support them, uh, whether it's the Dolphins, the Heat, the NHL Panthers that they've had, um, even the University of Miami. I mean, the Marlins have been, you know, such a hit or miss where when the fan base is going to come. But soccer, I think, might have a niche down there because it's such a cultural, diverse area um, that a lot of people, you know, live, breathe, and love soccer. So you might be able to, with Inner Miami, be that niche place um you know listen here in the metro area between new york city and between red bull there's so many other things that pull people away that you know sometimes people make make comments about attendance i mean i've been to every stadium now that major league soccer has you go to a place like portland you go to a place like kansas city um and and some of those other spots they are all about what's going on and i think our fan base with Red Bull is all about it as well. Um, but it's just so busy on a, on a Saturday or a Sunday. Sometimes it's hard to have the full attention of the sports fan. Um, but yeah, I mean, names like Beckham, I think you'll see more of those names be part of major league soccer moving forward, but be able to have that reputation and maybe be able to parlay it into getting other players to come here, I think will be important and big for the league moving forward for sure. I guess my, my last soccer related question, uh, you mentioned uh, the promotion relegation aspect. I wanted you to kind of settle a debate I had at FC Monmouth last summer uh, because I met some people who kind of embraced this idea, maybe not necessarily at the first uh, the first level of, of Major League Soccer, but the levels underneath of it. What's, my first question is, what's your opinion on that in the American soccer landscape? And then to follow up on that, what do you think is the future for the lower levels of American soccer in the in the post-COVID world? Um, concerning, to answer you, your last question first. I, I mean, listen, it's not easy for teams at the lower level in the first place, and it's a struggle right now because you've all – everybody's lost their season. Um, and you have seen – some. Uh, heard of and seen some teams already say that they won't be moving forward because missing one year is enough to essentially financially ruin the plan that they had moving forward. Um, I hope that's only a short-term thing and the lower leagues are there because it is really important for the development of soccer in this country to um, have, have teams at all levels be part of it. Um, you know, what happens with promotion relegation? I mean, Major League Soccer is definitely a different animal in that regard because they they don't have it, um, and it's all. But it is a little different. I, I think if I had to predict the sports soccer landscape in the next 10, 15, 20 years, I think at some point you will see some form of it um, because at some point you mentioned the league getting to thirty teams. You can't keep growing. You can't have fifty teams in Major League Soccer across, but. Once teams have a pretty good foothold, um, you know, could you could you create a playoff between the USL and Major League Soccer? I think you can. And I think at some point, I think that will happen. Um, you know, difficult if you were doing it right now because you're not being promoted into Major League Soccer. If you're an expansion team, you're paying a fee. So you're paying that fee to be part of Major League Soccer. It probably wouldn't be right to tell <clears throat> somebody, OK, come on into major league soccer, but a year later, you might be out. That's just not, that's not going to be a, a selling point for anybody. But I do think once the league stops expanding and 
the other leagues underneath them, the first level of USL becomes a little bit more concrete, then I think you might be able to see some movement moving forward. Herman, I did want to ask you, as a lifelong Philadelphia Union fan, they have done incredibly well this year. Do you think that they're the team to beat? I mean, I, I hope that you're seeing the face that I'm making. You're making me ask answer a question about yeah. a Philadelphia team and the Union, nonetheless. I, I, there's not there's not a Philly sports team, Ryan, that I enjoy. I've had the displeasure of looking at that Philly's cardboard cutout that you have behind you the entire part of this interview uh listen the union have done a great job are they the team to beat i don't know i and and that's not a cop out i would say i don't know that there is a team to beat this year in major league soccer because of the current situation and circumstances the playoffs are always crazy anyway and and i've seen a union playoff game up close and in person because they knocked us out last year in the opening round of the mls playoffs I think for Philadelphia, as well as they have been playing, if they are the team that finishes at the top of the table this year and wins the supporter shield, the regular season championship, I think they're going to put themselves in a position that they're going to have a huge target on their back and a lot of pressure that maybe they normally wouldn't. Um, you know, you, you don't see it in a lot of sports anywhere. The team that wins the regular season, whatever that might mean in different different sports and different leagues, that team usually isn't the team that wins the championship at the end. Uh, the union are, are very talented. Jim Curtin has done a great job with that team. They, they've, to be quite honest, they've actually followed a little bit of the Red Bull plan, implementing a lot of homegrown players, supplementing them with a couple of veteran guys along the way. Um, the team to beat, I'm not sure if I would say team to beat, but Ryan, to your point, and to maybe put a little feather in your Philadelphia cap, uh, they will be a very difficult team to play in the playoffs. I'm glad you brought up your disdain for for Philadelphia because there's something that you had, had tweeted a couple of years ago that, that I took a lot of offense to. Um, so this was on December 7th, 2018, uh, and you said, Mike takes some heat for this one from PHL peeps. No need will add a concert to start a stupid Eagles chant. Save it for Sunday, so obnoxious, be better. So, so it seems like this has been building up for a while. Well, listen, to be fair, I, I, I don't like Philadelphia. I don't like – I like the town. I love the city. Um, I despise the Eagles. The, the Flyers, I, I, I don't even know words to describe my disdain for them. I don't like the Sixers, although I love the trust the process. That's worked out really well. For them, I love that they were swept in four by the Celtics during the course of the playoffs this year. Um, I mean, really, I mean, I hate to say it this way. The only team that I it, it, I could take or leave and they don't really have any impact on me is the Phillies. Um, but but Ryan, to your point in, in 2018, I'm there at a concert. I want to listen to the music. And because I'm in Philadelphia, it means I have to be subjected to an Eagles chant during the course of the concert. And it's, I didn't pay my money for that. I paid my money to listen to music. Well, that was right after the, uh, the Super Bowl run, I think too. Uh, uh, so I think you're, you're going to hear Eagles chants in Philadelphia, no matter what. I mean, I hear them going to the grocery store sometime. So that, so his Philadelphia famineship is a lot worse than me coming in, wearing a Tom Brady Jersey to your office three times a week. Yeah, because <clears throat> Tom Brady, I think, is a is a tremendous player. I might not like the Patriots or now the Bucks, but there's no disputing the fact that Tom Brady is one of the greatest players um, in the history of sports, NFL, or any other. He's one of the, the, the best winners ever. He's one of the best players that's ever played in any sport. Um, I mean, when was the last time you could say that about anybody that's played in Philadelphia? Okay, well, Harmon, uh, uh, I, I want to end you by asking this. Uh, you are a doctor now, so among Dr. J, Doc Rivers, where do you rank yourself among the, fav the famous doctors in the world? I mean, uh, clearly right at the top, Ryan, to be fair. I mean, I think you've, you've got to take the most current, as I've said many times in class, try and take the timeliness of things and put it towards the top of your sportscast. Make that the lead. Uh, yes, among other doctors, 
I, I, I may have fell short in some regards, but because I just finished my program this week, I might be the newest and then therefore the most important. Well, Harmon, this has been great. I want to thank you so much for taking the time out of your, your busy schedule to, to do this with us. We'd love to have you on again sometime soon. Guys, I'd be psyched to come on and, and chat sports with you anytime. I appreciate uh, what you guys are embarking on. Hopefully it is uh, not just successful, but also keeps you guys happy and, and lets you do things that you love and want to be involved with. Um, and anything that I can do for you uh, along the way, you know that, that, that I'm right at the top of your list in terms of being a fan of both of you guys. Thanks, Armin. Appreciate it. Thank you.